Hi, welcome everyone to Refactor. I'm Tara Walker. I'm a principal software engineer at Azure IT, and I am really into the IoT of things, Internet of things. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about microcontrollers. Got to add the cloud in there. And of course, there has to be a chance of artificial intelligence because why not? All right, so let's get started. Got a lot to do. First, let's talk about what is this IoT thing again. I know a lot of you guys are probably like, I keep hearing this buzzword IoT. Great, what is that? Think about it just as a bunch of sensors that are going to run on something, typically a, a processor of some kind. I'm going to connect that to the internet, either that's going to be through Wi-Fi, cellular, other avenues. And then I'm going to connect that to some cloud service, AWS, Google, obviously I want you to use Azure, or I can connect it to my own dedicated server or another microcomputer. And once I have that done, I just need to know what I want to do with it. Do I want to trigger something else? Do you want to turn on your lights? Do you want your uh, voice device to say, hey, answer your ring device, for instance, at the door? Do I want my lights to come on and off? Once you have this process, that actually controls different things by sending circuits. That, in a nutshell, is what IoT is. It's a way to connect these things, these little computers, if you will, with electricity and these sensors to it, to the internet, hopefully to someone's cloud to help you scale it to a server and then to perform some action. No more, no less than that. Now, okay, that's cool. You got it. That's what IoT is. Now, how do you build this IoT thing? Like, okay, that's really cool. I usually buy something off the shelf. It works, but I'm an engineer. I want to know how to build it. Let's talk about that. First of all, you're going to have to program these sensors with a programming language. Duh, Tara, right? Of course. What we typically do in the IoT world, we usually work with C or C++. You have, if you're first starting out, you have some people that'll start off with Arduino C, but at the end of the day, it's still going to be C and C++ as the primary programming language for it. Now, saying all that to say, there are obviously um, some other contenders in that space, probably not as well versed and embedded, and it also depends on, of course, what type of device will get there. But you have other programming languages of choice. You have Python, um, you have uh, MicroPython, you have Rust. You also have C-sharp, believe it or not, for certain devices. Now, once we got that programming thing down, we've picked our programming language, we're going to start sending data. You need a driver to do that. All of these sensors have driver. They're pretty common upon the market. And then I'm going to then have to do something where I build the connected system. So I'm going to have an OS running, possibly. We'll talk about that. Uh, that runs on these boards that will then connect to things. I then may need to go up to the cloud. So I may need some SDKs that are related to whatever cloud you're picking, Azure, right? And uh, then if I want to do prediction models with AI, I may also need some AI frameworks like TensorFlow, uh, you know, MXNet, et cetera. And then I'm going back to making my decisions. Either I can do it where I'm detecting motion, right? You know, that's a typical one. This is the same process you would do that. So these are the typical steps of doing that. All right. Operating systems, I said it was gonna get here. Now, you see a laundry list of ones. All operating systems for IoT is not created equal. In fact, there's uh, something we call RTOS, and I'll talk about that in a minute, that is kind of not quite what you would expect for operating system. However, what are those top operating systems? You can see the primary ones in the market are embedded Linux and free RTOS, which are very different animals when you talk about development. And then you see the rest of them that are out there. Um, and I don't wanna say the rest of them as I'm diminishing different ones, but again, there are a lot of operating systems. I wanna make one note because of course I work for Microsoft, so I have to do this. You see where it says Microsoft and Windows 10. I wanna be very clear about that. That includes ThreadX. So ThreadX is our RTOS. Um, I got this from an embedded source, so I didn't want to alter it, so it'd just be authentic. But think about ThreadX is similar to free RTOS in that that is our RTOS. We'll talk about what RTOS are in a minute, because you're like, wait, RTOSs? I'm sure. Now, we got the operating systems. So what, what makes these chips? What are these top hardware silicon vendors? What, what am I talking about? So you see all these chips that are running around and all these weird boards that we always are programming against. There are what we call silicon vendors that make those. So Texas Instruments, ST Micro, Microchip, Expressive, there's a bunch of them. I know this seems weird, like what is she talking about? 
I'm going to show you some of these devices. But as an IoT, IoT person of an engineer, I'm going to have to pick, hmm, what board do I need? What chip do I need? Why do I need it? What sensors do I need? And how do I put that all together? And everything is not created equal when it comes to chips. So you make those decisions based upon your needs. So now you know, we got operating systems, we got a board. All right, programming language. I talked about this briefly, but I wanted to kind of give you a complete view of what people use for IoT. Now, when it says UML and other modeling languages, you have a bunch of things that are coming out that are trying to, when you don't need the performance, help you to get to the IoT world without having to use certain languages. So again, that's an option. It's very atypical. You'll see what primarily rules the market when it comes to developing is going to be in C++. I live in C++. C++. I love C++. C++. Uh, I don't know why you guys don't love it. But those are the primary ones that if you're developing IoT that you are going to be immersed in. Of course, Python is there. And then like I mentioned, C Sharp. Another one that is not used, well, what, what you see is not used typically, but I want to be really clear about this, is assembly language, especially be because before IoT became much more what I call democratized about being able to use C and C++ much more often. Those of us who have been around a while, we were using assembly languages, uh, <laughs> very large uh, instruction sets, uh, if you guys are uh, geeks like me. And using assembly language to do that, uh, it's really nice that we now can use some of the higher end languages. So while assembly is very low for performance, there are still some things, times where I actually will make assembly like calls. So again, you probably don't have to do that, but it's the world I live in. Now, I want to talk about this because this is something that people don't understand. And I'm going to show some devices really quickly and then uh, we'll come back to the slides. But microprocessor, microcontroller. Now, this is all about my controllers because that's my favorite thing, but I would be remiss if I didn't explain these differences. So a microcontroller is really going to be a really small device. It's going to have very little RAM. It's what we call a system on chip. So your operating systems, your peripherals, your typical things you expect on an operating system all operate on this one chip. It's not like, again, a microprocessor, which is closer to what you would consider your CPU, it's gonna have external RAM. I'm gonna have an external flash. I may have external data bus. I may have an external um, SSD that's storing my file system. That's what an MPU is and much closer, even though smaller, but much closer to what you would expect in your laptop. MCUs are not like that. Everything is on this chip, your RAM, your flash. So all that storage is there. And these can get very small. Um, these run anywhere between eight bit. Yes, I said eight bit. Uh, all the way up to 32-bit, you find a few that are really getting heavy and beefy with 64-bit processors or microcontrollers, but that's really rare. You typically find the more beefy ones are around 32-bit, but again, I can get a real small 8-bit uh, uh, device. And that device, quite frankly, could maybe have a mega RAM. And that could be beefy. I mean, now we're getting a little bit bigger, but again, so you have to be really efficient. In contrast, a microprocessor, you get a little bit of more levity there. And then what we have, what we call embedded systems, they're usually very specialized. Uh, the software and hardware are fundamentally collected. And really this overarching theme is what you see when it comes to IoT. I'm gonna switch really quickly and I'll come back to this, but I just wanna show you the difference in what a microprocessor is and a microcontroller. So let's go to my trusty dot cam. Voila, you see some devices there, hopefully clearly. So everything you see that I'm showing right now is a microprocessor. Now, these microprocessors, this has a, this board and everything else is not the microprocessor. This is just the sensor. On the back here is where you see the chipset and everything else. What is driving all of these things is not all these little wonderful connectors you see. It's actually this chip. These chips right here are what I'm actually programming against. Now, conversely, I said I was going to talk about what's the difference between a microprocessor. This is a Raspberry Pi, right? So hopefully you can see that. You guys are typically accustomed to Raspberry Pis. Um, this Raspberry Pi is what I consider to be a microprocessor. Um, even though it, you know, is uh, what everyone starts off with the IoT world in, it's, it runs Linux. Uh, you can put a separate hard drive on it. So if you turn it over, typically you'll see I have a, a SD flash card. I can do this with microcontrollers. But again, I have a bunch of peripherals here that I add 
to this board and based upon the processor, because I'm running a full operating system, it really is not a microcontroller. I have, I mean, these things can get super beefy here where uh, now I think the latest uh, Raspberry Pi 4, I have up to eight gigs. Yeah, never would happen on a microprocessor. So again, that's just a difference. So don't get confused by the fact that, oh, well, they all look the same size. That's just based upon the PCB. That, that board, that green board with all the connectors is what we call the PCB. It's just a control board. And the chip that we're programming against, those are these things here. The rest of this is what we would just consider to be sensors. All right, so that's just a quick, you know, that's the difference there, keeping moving. What's the anatomy of this whole MCU? So this is a microchip, uh, anatomy of a microchip uh, at mega 328P. Um, it's gonna have that processor that you talk about, but everything you see here on here is what's on that chip. So that means all of these things is contained in that chip which means I have to be very efficient. These things can be very small. You see, again, 8-bit, 16-bit. I have UART, that's serial. That's how data comes across. SPI, um, I can have this connected to a flash drive, which would be storage, but I would have SPI locally on here. I can have different ports to connect to different things. Oops, went too fast. Um, but this is what really we're talking about here. I have circuits. Uh, I have a timer, and each board has a different timer to do with the clock speeds. Um, I won't get into a lot of this because we don't have as much time, but this is where we're talking about truly, hey, this is what a microcontroller is. A little different than what you probably would think about in your computer, but all these things sound the same, right? You have ports, GPIO, peripherals, timers. Everything is just on that chip, which is why you would hear a lot of microcontrollers talked about as systems on chips. Now, I have this chip, it's running. That's great. It does nothing for me without a sensor. Everything's about the sensors. So this is just an example of some sensors that I can connect to these microcontrollers to control different things, soil moisture, distance, time. Um, I have a video when uh, I was with another cloud company where we actually programmed uh, where it would automatically water my plant using a device by using these sensors of soil moisture and everything else. So the sensors are what really drives the actions because this is what's going to give me data need data from to be processed. That's why you care about the IoT things, right? All right, so let's keep going. Actuators. Now, what's funny is people always kind of confuse actuators with sensors. Think about it as sensors are sensing your environment. Actuators, I, I always say, are actually driving engines. Like I need a motor driver to connect other things. I need a water pump to do things. No, that's not the official definition. It's just like the way how I like to think about it. So you have actuators and you have uh, sensors. Now, again, I'm giving you such the layman terms of it. I will put obviously in our chat as we talk in it, really definitions for this, but I really want to keep it really simple, really something you can relate to. And that's how I always, when I was coming up through this IoT world, would remember my actuators. Uh, but again, please know that this is not what the real definition is. This is, a, you know, what I am deeming to be. But I'll give you a, just a quick and dirty about, you know, uh, they're going to perform some action, right, based upon the physical world, where sensors are sensing the physical world. So if you remember nothing else about that, actuators perform action, which is why I said they do stuff, and then sensors sense. That's the best quick and dirty way to remember that a great definition of that. All right, so keep it moving. Now, we talked about programming. So I know what a microcontroller is now, check. I know what these sensors are, I connect to it, check, great. Now we're getting into the programming, the part I like the most. Um, you have several IDEs to do this. I'm a VS Code command line kind of girl, but that's just kind of where my space is. Um, how you do this is you're going to develop on something, whether it's Notepad, Visual Studio Code, or one of these IDEs. Uh, one caveat here, when I says ESP IDF, ESP IDF is not an IDE. It is actually a framework. I just put that in because you still develop on that in a certain way where it gives you a little bit of things there, but that's not an official IDE. Just want to be clear. So you don't look at this later and go, what is she talking about? Um, 
So how do I develop on this? I'm going to have an IDE of some sort or a command line, or you know, you can use VI, Nano, Vim, it's still fine. Um, I'm going to then have a compiler. There are several different compilers. For instance, the expressive devices use, uh, it still uses GCC, but it uses a uh, tool chain. And I'm gonna write some code and then I'm gonna flesh it to the MCU. They're gonna create object files just like you would do at C, off to the races. Now, what is the RTOS? Gonna keep this really simple because I wanna get into code because that's always fun. Uh, RTOS is what's considered to be a real-time operating system. But let me tell you a trick. It really is not an operating system. What an RTOS really is, is in my mind, a really exceptional task scheduler. So I have scheduling, I have task management, um, obviously the still common operating system, metaphors of semaphores, uh, mutexes, preemption, everything else. I have memory management, resource allocation, interrupt handling, you know, the basic really guts of kind of what scheduling is, but that's really what an RTOS is. It's doing more task management than process management. And obviously, you know, if you think about it, I can't do full processes that may spawn multiple tasks and things of that nature because I have very little memory, very little RAM. So again, it seems like things are operating uh, in real time and simultaneously, but really, if you look at it, which was what a CPU would do, real-time operating systems really only execute one task at a time. It just do it super efficiently. So from a hardware perspective, I have my application. It's running its RTOS. This all gets compiled in. And then I have a HAL, a hardware abstraction layer, and then that talks to the hardware. So again, very different than what you would consider with your CPU. Can I live without one? Of course you can. Hey, assembly is a thing. So you can actually build state machines, do polling, do other things, and you can build this with assembly. Um, but guess what? It, the RTOS does a lot of the heavy lifting for you that you don't have to do with that, but you absolutely can do bare metal. Bare metal is sometimes necessary. So what is the challenge, right? So we have IoT devices, we have device SDKs, then you have the service back in. The whole thing is to leverage the typical protocol that's used with IoT, which is MQTT, and help them connect their devices. I'm gonna say here to Azure for the cloud, of course, because I work for Azure. So you, we wanna make this really easy for you to take all that hard work that you did with just getting this board up, the sensors running, and easily connect to Azure. So that's the challenge you'll find with some of the cloud part. Now, what is the challenge for people who are in the cloud and building these cool things? How do I let cloud developers work with these devices and they're building these cool SDKs and everything else? I'm going to give you a great example of this. This is our scenario for Azure, right? We have these various SDKs to suit your needs for what you need. I am doing Linux, so I might use the C99 SDK. I am doing hardcore, uh, maybe bare metal without an operating system, maybe with an operating system. So I'm going to use the embedded C SDK. You see very little there that would provide. I'm going to use ThreadX. That's the RTOS I've mentioned. I will give you some kind of ties into the operating system in Azure already. And then we have the free RTOS one. So typical operating systems, but depending on what kind of device, MPU or MCU, you now know what that is, you would use different things. All right, keeping moving because I want to get to this demo. La la demo. All right, so let's switch really quickly to code. Code is always nice to have. All right, so. Um, we're going to just talk about getting started. And right now I'm going to do this with an uh, expressive device. Now let me just quickly switch to my dot cam to show you what this expressive device looks like. This is the expressive device that I'm about to plug in. And this is the one that I'm going to build and flash on. So this is uh, an expressive 32 uh, device. It has a, the sensors of a screen. It has a humidity sensor. It has a temperature sensor and things like that. So again, that's what I'm going to use here. So let's go back to the code in the terminal. This is a really true getting started hello world for this. I am going to simply bring in the operating system uh, devices here. Uh, sorry, op real-time operating systems. Here I'm using free RTOS. I'm going to bring in the ESP system. That's uh, the typical how I'm going to talk to the hardware, um, that header file. And then I'm going to obviously talk to the flash, the storage on this. And all I'm going to do here is pretty much say, hey, this is an ESP chip, and just get basic data for it and restart. So let's see how we, I would compile this. So again, I told you I'm a command line girl, so I'm going to compile on the command. Um, sorry, on the command line. But this is the application I'm going to compile. So let's first look here, if you're looking at my terminal. These are my files. 
Uh, you're always going to have a C make list. This is typical C++ stuff, nothing special. So the only different here is with the, I'm using the IDF framework. So they have some specific systems. Everything has something different. SDM will have a different way of calling things uh, using that tool chain. This is using extensive tool chain, was a tool chain, just a way to build that has certain features. That's all it is. It is really keeping it simple. Um, and here I'm saying, hey, I'm just doing hello world. I'm gonna call a CMake file to tell it how to build. That's all that is. And then here I'm going to do make an ESP call to register this as a component with the ESP system. That's all that is. So not a big deal, not a lot here. One C file that has uh, information just simply about uh, the device. Last thing I'll talk about here because we did talk about really quickly uh, tasking systems. Um, you'll see here that I'm just starting a task. That's all I'm doing here. And you can start multiple tasks here. This is really simple, just one. I'm saying delay and do it. All right, so getting to the demo because we don't have a lot of time. We wanna make sure uh, we finish this information. So this is a build system for IDF. You can also use CMake, but I'm gonna just use their build system right here, the tool they have. Now, how would I, first thing I would do with this particular build system, this is just the type of microcontroller, you have different things. My favorite thing is, and you can use this with all kinds of microcontrollers, is a tool called kconfig. And it's really cool because I can then run this little menu and thing as, uh, upon build. Uh, and what I can do, let me give a little bit more real estate here. What I can do when I run this uh, make menu config, it, it actually goes out and builds and I can dynamically set things. Like I want to set my Wi-Fi dynamically. I want to set uh, I want to change something dynamically. I want it to pull in a binary file dynamically. I can have this run and then flash and dynamically change things with my board without rewriting code. So that's really, you know, kind of powerful there. Uh, I will determine, for instance, what serial port am I on? Uh, how do I want this to flash? What's the flash size, right? Uh, maybe I want the flash size to be bigger. In this case, it's small because I only have very little. Uh, do I want to reset this bootleg uh, bootloader before flashing. I want to detect the size. If I'm going to monitor this, how does that work? So let me just compile really quickly. So I'm not going to make any changes here. Um, it saves that to a header file, does it for you. You're off to the races. So really quickly, how would I build this? Um, I would do build here. Now I've already built, so I won't do this. It'll take a while. But once it builds, it's going to give me this, uh, what we call e um, is elf file. Um, so it'll give me this elf file and you'll see it has, you know, all this information, the header file, these are all the binary files. This is oops, how uh, I built, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Um, and so you'll see here, there's this elf file, this map file, this bin file. These are the binary files that are, are going to be used. That's going to get flashed in the board. You'll see, I talked about my favorite thing, case config. So it has a partition table. It's, this is the, the build to it. And all of that goodness goes into these binary files here. All right, uh, let me just run this really quickly and then we'll get back to the slides. So if I'm going to flash this then, um, well, first when I, let me build this, when I would, when I would build that then, um, it was going to run the CMake file that you see, it's going to go out, it's going to look at this code, it's going to look at the IDF, and then it's going to build this and it's going to give me that L file. I'm just going to leave that running in the background because again, and it'll take a minute and who wants the board by looking at that happen? So I'm gonna let that uh, go in a minute and I'll show you how to flash. So let's go back really quickly to the slides. All right, so um, I showed you that, that's building in the background. Where does AI come in? Because while it's building, we'll, we'll talk about that. This is a brand new world and I'm really excited about it that we have now in this IoT world. Uh, we have, you probably are familiar with TensorFlow, the NORA framework, but we're now bringing AI into this IoT world. And I don't know if you're excited, but I'm thrilled excited because this is something that was not able to be done before. Um, now we have TensorFlow Lite. It is a project. It's a Google open source project. There are two flavors of it. So we know now you know which you know, MCU and MPU is. There's TensorFlow Lite that's designed for smartphones, Linux, and Raspberry Pi. Um, it's deployed right now to do billion devices in production. It's pretty powerful. And then we have TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Remember I told you, microcontroller is my favorite thing. Um, it's only a few hundred kilobytes, which is, you know, that could be too large for this microcontroller I talked to you about. Um, 
if we want to run MCUs, we need to be really small. And this is where this comes in. So now, and those small chipsets that maybe even have only a meg of everything. And when a meg means the operating system, the flash, the everything, that's all it has to run all of that. It's, I can now you put a model on this board that can do prediction like, oh, there's motion. That means based upon this motion, I'm detecting this person's face. Um, I wanna give you some resources. And then after I give you some resources, this is the last thing I'll show you. I wanna go back to my board um, and then I'll leave time for questions. Here are some resources, because this is a lot to cover in this short period of time. And I know we went really fast. So hopefully you'll probably have to go through this quite a bit. But I wanted to give you resources to follow up on this. Because again, I just the simple of the time we don't have time to do with some of the cool things I want to show you. But you can do this even without me. So here are some resources uh, for you to get started in what I'm showing you here. Um, a bunch of different ones uh, that are available as classes. And then um, this is where I'll leave time for questions, but let me show you the device while you're asking those questions. Let me go back to my dot cam. So last thing here. So I showed you this oops, expressive device. I'm going to plug it in. I've actually flashed this one to a, a system to this that is going to read sensors. So, that, so I want to show you how this works. So let me try to get it so you can see it. All right. So you see here, there is a, I told you there was a temperature sensor, a humidity sensor, and a light sensor. And these the things are going to change. So let me just cover the light sensor right quick. And you'll see the light sensor is going to drop where I'm covering that light sensor. So it's detecting, oh, well, there's hardly no light. If I open that up again, turn this this way, you'll notice it comes back up where, oh, I'm detecting this amount of light. Um, the temperature is, it says it's 81.1. So it's probably a little warm, but that, you know, the temperature there and the humidity uh, is uh, 54.2. So this is actually detecting information and going here. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but please follow up with me if you are interested. This is the data actually is right now, it's going to the cloud and it is actually processing and doing other things based upon me sending it in the cloud. But this is just shows you how you use these sensors and how these are dynamic. Like I said, if I cover this sensor, it actually deter determines the light and everything and the temperature. And as I cover this, you notice uh, covering it makes actually the temperature go up because again, I'm heating up that sensor as well. So again, that's kind of a quick and dirty overview of uh, microcontrollers. I'll now just open it up for any questions.